subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Can we look inside of a volcano? deep underground as the magma flows in chambers and veins beneath our feet. We can't with our eyes and we cannot visually, but there is a trick that we can employ that can let us see how a volcano is structured under the ground. This is something that we have been using to peek inside otherwise inaccessible things like the insides of mountains, deep depths of the Egyptian pyramids and nuclear reactors. This trick employs cosmic rays or extremely high energy rays that come from outer space. In this video, we'll take a look at what cosmic rays are, what muons are and how we can use these trillions and trillions of subatomic particles that are moving close to the speed of light to actually look inside things that we otherwise cannot. I'm Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. Cosmic rays are high energy protons and neutrons that move around through space at almost the speed of light. They come from a lot of high energy phenomena out there in the universe. One such example is our sun, but there are also other high energy events like a supernova or even the interstellar medium, which is dust and gas that exists between two stars. Cosmic rays were first discovered in 1912 by the Austrian physicist Victor Hess when he sent up three balloons to measure electromagnetic radiation in our atmosphere and in space. Of course, he won the Nobel for it a couple of decades later. Every second, there are trillions and trillions of cosmic rays that bombard our Earth. Even Vikram Sarabhai was one of the pioneering physicists who performed research into it in the 40s, both here in Bangalore as well as in Kashmir. These cosmic rays decay when they hit the nuclei of atoms of gases in our atmosphere such as oxygen and nitrogen. When they decay, they result in particles called pions which are unstable and quickly decay to particles called muons. Muons are similar to electrons and are negatively charged, but they have about 200 times the mass of electrons. We have no idea why muons exist and what role they play in building the universe or matter, but they do exist. Because muons are so tiny, they pass through most objects, including solid objects. Some muons are stopped while others pass through. They actually penetrate deeper than X-rays and they don't do any damage because they're not harmful radiation and they are literally all around us all the time. There are an estimated 10,000 muons per minute hitting per square meter here on Earth. So they can be used and applied to see things which we otherwise cannot see. This field of study is known as muography. Muography works on the principle that when muons pass through matter, they lose energy to the electrons around them. This slows them down and they eventually decay as they slow down into electrons and neutrinos. A lot of us have probably heard of neutrinos before. Once again, we associate them with trillions and trillions and trillions of them passing through our bodies every second. But with muons, the thicker the material that they pass through, the faster they lose energy and decelerate. So this energy mapping can actually help us create an image of how dense an object is and what its structure could be. To do this, a detector is placed below the object that we want to look at because cosmic rays come from outer space. So these detectors peer up at the sky from where the muons are descending. They then pass through the object and we can obtain something that is like the shadow of an object. The muon density map is compared then with the map of the free sky and free muons. And this can tell us how many muons have been blocked and thus help us understand the structure of whatever we're looking at. The field of muography is fast growing and has been applied in many places. Physicists have used it to look inside the Great Pyramid at Giza to look for any hidden chambers or rooms and they actually discovered a previously hidden chamber that is about 30 meters long in the Great Pyramid. It is thought that this chamber might actually be 
leading to a connected room that has valuable artifacts inside it, but the pandemic came and has put a stop to that research. Similarly, it was also used to study the Fukushima disaster where after the reactor shattered in 2011, Japanese scientists had to figure out what exactly happened. So they set up two muon detectors, each weighing about 20,000 kilos and housed inside of a box with thick iron walls to protect the equipment from radiation. The detectors scanned the reactor site for five months in 2015. With this data, the scientists discovered that they did not see any evidence of nuclear fuel that should have been in the core of the reactor. So they were able to conclude that the fuel had actually melted down and is now either inside the reactor containment vessel or is among the debris on the floor. These findings are important because knowing where the fuel is, is necessary for cleaning efforts and then decommissioning these reactors. The fuel was to be removed this year in 2021, but once again, the pandemic put a stop to that. The field of muography is growing fast and its applications are numerous because more than things like ground penetrating radar, muons can actually penetrate deeper into solid objects such as the ground and rocks. So we can scan things underground below layers and layers of rocks. And in the process of muography itself, there isn't anything much to do. Scientists just set up the detectors and then come back later to collect the data. Muography also has other potential applications. It can be used to detect nuclear fuel and nuclear waste. It can be used to detect chest cavities in humans. And it can even be used to scan architectural structures for defects. In 2019, muography was used to produce underground maps of Mount Echia, which is one of the earliest sites of settlement in Italy. Many hidden underground rooms and chambers were discovered below the archaeologists' feet, which need to be explored and, of course, that has also stalled because of the pandemic. But this technique is now being used to peek inside mountains and volcanoes. How well can we predict a volcanic eruption? It really depends on the volcano. There's periodicity, so we know how frequently some erupt. Sometimes there are signs leading up to it, which we can physically see, and we might get a warning of a few days, weeks, or a few hours, or a few minutes. A lot of the times, the monitoring of this comes in the form of monitoring seismic waves or quakes and tremors. Depending on the types of quakes and seismic waves that are registered, we can tell the intensity of volcanic activity that is going on and a little bit of its internal structure. There are also other signs like thermal changes with temperatures of the ground and water bodies going up, as seen in the fantastic movie Dante's Peak, which incidentally a lot of volcanologists actually really like. There's ground deformation and a whole bunch of other things that can predict an eruption. But what can give us a good understanding is all the gaps that need filling in terms of the actual structure of volcanoes and magma flow underground. Beneath our feet, near active volcano zones, there are chambers that either have magma or are empty, various kinds of rocks and other geological structures that are formed in a volcanic environment. Detectors can be placed around a volcano and because muons typically hit at all angles, it is easy to obtain a map of the structure. With one detector, a shadow-like 2D result is produced, but with multiple detectors, a 3D map of the structure can be created. In fact, muography itself kicked off as a field from a 1995 experiment where muons were used to peek into the Mount Tsukuba in Japan and its inner structure was mapped. Since then, it has been used to see various other mountains as well. Using muography to understand volcanoes is not going to be an end-all solution and will not make other techniques outdated or obsolete. Instead, it will be a great addition and a very good accessory to existing monitoring methodology and make effective and accurate predictions. It can take us maybe tens of hundreds of steps closer to both safety 
and an incredible human technical achievement.